Wow. Wow. I'm um I'm speechless. You might be able to hear the washing machine in the background as I'm talking, but I'm speechless. I am utterly, utterly, utterly speechless. I don't know what to say. Um, this comes after the on the back of United beating Paris Saint Germain three one away from home. Three one away from home after losing the first leg two nil. We're the only club to have come back from two goals down to win or to go through to the next round. Like this is just insane. And considering we had ten players out injured, um, if you if you including includes twelve, if you include Sanchez and Pogba, who are um, one's injured and one suspended, we effectively played our second string side against Paris Saint Germain, one of the strongest team in the European Champions League, a team that has um, the resources to buy any player in the world, the team that's located in fucking Paris, right, where most players want to go to. A team that has the mercurial um, Kylian Mbappe up front. A player who everyone's tipping to be the next Christian, the next um, Fat Ronaldo. A team that's stuck with midfield talent such as Verratti and Marquinhos. An experienced centre-back such as Thiago Silva. And legendary, world, <laughs> legendary um, world-class goalkeeper Buffon. Like, wow. Honestly, wow. I just can't get around to how big of a performance that was, man. Um, oh, by the way, I forgot to say, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number, what, 168, I think, or something. I'm your host, Agostino Zynga. It doesn't really matter the intro now. Um, I guess I'm just going to riff on United. Um, I don't normally talk about football on here, but um, I just had to, man. This is one of those one-of-a-kind one performances that you just have to mention. Um, again, the first leg of the Champions League against Paris Saint-Germain at home, we were severely outclassed. Paris Saint-Germain showed us exactly why they are one of the Europe's elite teams. Um, they completely tore us apart. Um, their midfield was strong. Their attack was even stupendous. Um, Kylian Mbappe showed us just why he's one of the greatest talents in world football. Um, Paul Pogba got sent off because he got frustrated. They just played us off the park completely, right? And there was no shame in that because I think prior to that, what Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has done with United is that he's brought back the feeling. He's brought back the the hunger he's brought back what it means to be a Manchester United team right we go into games now positive and optimistic that we can get a result but if we come up short because of lack of quality that's all well and good I don't think anyone even during the Mourinho years um even when you go back to Louis van Gaal or David Moyes was under the impression that we were one of the world's elite teams but what we wanted to see was effort what we wanted to see was attacking the tent from the players that were available and we never really saw that under our previous managers and now Solskjaer has done the same thing. So when our players come up short against better teams, we've, we, are, we are the first to put our hands up. I think out of all the sides in world football, especially in the, in the Premier League, I think United fans are the least delusional. We honestly have a better perception of what our players are like than anyone else. When there, when there was a time when a lot of fans out there were singing the praises of people like Mara and Fellaini. And, you know, United fans the world over were like, no, he's just not good enough for what we're going to do. If you want to play Route 1 football, he's good enough, but he's not. So we're, we're quite honest when it comes to our team. We just wanted to see a better level of performance. We weren't getting that. And Solskjaer has done that. So even though the first leg result was bad, we still came out of it holding our heads up high. And since then, we've basically, <laughs> we've effectively won every other game since then. We then go away to Paris Saint-Germain with injuries on, on, on top of injuries. Um, but we also go into, with maybe an inkling of belief, right? Lukaku hits form just when we need him to hit form. Um, Rashford comes back from a niggling injury where he kind of twisted his ankle and we kind of thought he wasn't going to perform, but he did. We had someone like Diego Dalot who's showing us in a couple of games that he's played that he can step up. We had McTominay come into a bit of form. Fred come into a bit of form. Pereira come into a form. So it may be the result isn't as surprising as we think it was. But, but the game started off better than we could ever imagine, right? In the first three minutes, we score a goal. And I think what you've seen, especially in the top level of football, when you're up, reach upper echelons, most of the times, teams have moments. Regardless of how poor you are, how bad you play. And I think you've noticed that a lot in the World Cups, especially if the World Cup, especially if it's a team like an Iceland or um, another, uh, a Sweden, um, a Portugal, one of those teams that doesn't necessarily have world-class talent all over the pitch. If they get 
an opportunity. They usually get opportunities during the game. They usually get one or two opportunities that falls to their better players. And if their better players can punish the team, they can get a result out of it. And we're so lucky that just as we're playing Paris Saint-Germain, Lukaku's coming into some great form and he finishes the goal. It's a very hard finish to finish. Um, he gets put through. There's a bit of confusion at the back between the centre-back and Buffon. Somehow the ball slips through into Lukaku's path. He nudges it on the ball. I think when I was watching it, it looked like he miscontrolled it, but the ball skidded across the surface because it was extremely wet. As it skidded across the surface, Lukaku was able to kind of stretch onto the ball and clip it in. Like last last ditch tackle, last ditch kind of effort at the, at the end. And you're like, oh my God, is this going to really happen? But again, I wasn't really holding up much hope because I thought in the back of my head, there's no way we're not going to concede. We have a defence. I think we were playing three at the back at the time. Um, I don't really trust Smalling. He's he's not really the best defender that we have in our club. He's always prone to an error. Um, Lindelof is probably our best centre back, and Bay is just a you know he's too uh, he's too unpredictable. So I wasn't convinced that we we're gonna go in this game without not conceding a goal. We do concede a goal, a pretty well taken goal on PSG's side of things. Um, Kylian Mbappe puts the afterburners on. Um, is able to beat the offside trap, latches onto a ball and sh- shifts, um, shoots it across the, the box. Which he, he does that quite often if you watch League One. He does that quite move quite often where he kind of bends his run, comes back around, um, um, hits the bar line and whips across in. And then um, at the back post, I think it was um, I'm not sure who the player was at the back post and he knocked it in. And you're thinking, fuck. The floodgates are going to open, and we thought that floodgates going to open because soon after that, PSG got control of the ball. They had possession. We were not touching the ball. I think we had like eleven percent possession in the first half, or twenty percent overall in the entire game. It just seemed as if like nothing was going to really bounce or go our way, right? Because we needed again to get back into the game, and I think sometimes managers like Pep Guardiola and the, and the like. They really emphasize um, possession of the football because if you have possession of the football, that means you're in control. And the other team are chasing and holding the ball is easier than chasing it around, right? Anyone that's played five-a-side football will know that. So there is a part of me that's like, even though we're not a possession-based side, the fact that we gave up so much possession was making me nervous that we weren't going to be able to get it back. And when we were going to get it back, we were going to be too exhausted. Luckily, that didn't happen. Um, we got, we kind of like, were able to hold it until half time, which was probably the best result we could have done. We held on until half time, and then we grew into the second half. The second half comes; they hit the they hit the ground running too. Um, we end up nicking a goal um, from Rashford's long effort, which was some again another great. No, that, that was before the the half ended actually. So we scored just before the half ended again, don't we? Right? Yeah, that was. Um, Rashford hits a shot from twenty five yards out, and you could see what he was doing. He purposely tried to hit it in effort of trying to make the keeper make a save to parry it out. He smashed it, Buffon parried it out, and Lukaku was there again to pounce and knock, knock it in. And then we held on until half time. And you're just thinking, no way, man. Like, literally, no way is this going to work. And then, um, still, PSG are in control because they score one goal on the counter and we're over and it's kind of done, right? Um, and you kind of got the feeling that they were managing the end of the first half quite well. Buffon was trying to get them to calm down. You saw Mbappe telling them to calm down. They were really trying to add composure. They were kind of playing the ball around us towards the end of the first first half. And you kind of felt like they were just going to come out the second half and hit the ground running. That didn't really transpire. If anything, we kind of grew more into the game. I think the fact that we went into the, the second half, um, we went into halftime in the lead, gave us confidence, right? I think some of the players out there were really starting to believe that they could do this, make this happen. So we came out second half and kind of the more more of the same con- ca- continued, carried on. We didn't really get that many opportunities, but we were still trying to press. Uh, Fred and Pereira and McTominay were really starting to grow into the game, especially on Fred. Fred, especially Fred, man. He's been much maligned. He's had a really shocking start to his um, United career, and it doesn't seem like anything is kind of going well for him at the time. But he really, really, really put, he didn't put a foot wrong. Did he? He didn't put a fucking foot wrong. He didn't put one foot wrong at all. One foot wrong, man. Um, he was on the he was on the front foot, trying his hardest, really trying to penetrate, um, really trying to hold on to the ball in, in tight areas and spread the ball out wide. Pereira running, 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 running his lungs out. McTominay was giving as good as he gets against Marquinhos, like as niggly and dirty as they got. He got niggly and dirty too. It was just an incredible performance from all of them. And then luck, as luck would have it, um, Dalot comes on, um, obviously in the first half of Bay, who 
didn't play too well. And if anything, he you know he might have been faking. He had an injury. I think he was a, he was kind of shocking in the first half. Um, him and Young on that right hand side were getting absolutely destroyed. Um, it seems that like PSG really targeted our right hand side or were really kind of adamant to make sure that was where the joy was coming from. Which obviously shows that a lot of opposition side think you know Young is probably our weakest link in the team. So they were kept attacking that side, and then um, obviously the low comes on and. I think Mourinho's legacy is tarnished. Um, obviously, he left a very toxic environment when he left United. So much so that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, all he had to do was bring in a, some fucking um, biscuits and chocolates from his home country and give it to the receptionist. And he automatically lifted the mood, right? So um, he did a lot of bad stuff at United. We know that. That's really pretty obvious. But one of the things that we have to really thank him for is uh, the signing of Diego Delot. Like, that kid looks like a world-class player. He looks like a really top-level player. Um the fact that he's 19 years old and he's being able to play at this level, um, the fact that he's starting a bit shaky in his kind of United career, and the fact that he's so attacking, the fact that he can, you know, faint and do a step over and bend it around the corner. And now we know for sure, Diego Delo is never a right back. Like, forget him playing a right back. He's a right winger all day long. It puts us in a more of a predicament because it means we have to buy two right backs, right? We've got to buy someone um, as an, a, a kind of an understudy to Ashley Young and obviously a first team starter because Ashley Young needs to be phased out of that side eventually, um, sooner rather than later. But Diego Dolo, what a performance. He was consistently providing an outlet, always kind of on th the threat was there. And again, I think having a player like him play in our team, just having him sit on the byline and ask for the ball is always going to preoccupy the left back of, um, of PSG's mind and it's going to keep them awake. Um, to not let sure that he doesn't go through. So Diego Lowe comes on, has an has a really, really big impact, so much so that he kind of latches onto a ball that comes across him and you're just thinking he's going to do a Hollywood shot. Like a, I was, I was, in, First of all, I thought it was going to be like a, um, Rafa De Silva against, was it against Southampton? That shot he had from way out far and just clipped the top corner. I thought he was going to have one of those shots, but from what the looks of it, it looks like he bent back a bit too far and was going over anyway. But luck would have it... Um, um, Kim Pembe decided to jump up and turn his back to the goal and have his arms out wide and it clipped his elbow as it went out. It was obviously a clear defection. Look, I was going to go out for a corner. And then obviously Diego Dolo contested the, the the corner and lo and behold, it, the referee decided to go to VAR. And the VAR thing, the VAR thing for me is weird because for the longest time, right, when you watch football, uh, pundits and journalists and whoever, co-commentators, bemoan and really complain um that refereeing standards overall aren't that good right there's a in uh, maybe it's the same in most professions right there's a really elite um one percent or five percent of referees and everyone else is really mediocre um they always bemoan the fact that these referees make these big decisions get the big decisions wrong that really affect the directory of a club really impact the final result or really cost um teams you know trophies and whatever it may be so decisions are mo one of the most important things in football right and it seemed like um, with the introduction of VAR, it would suddenly we get away from having that element of human error that really um, cost people mistakes, cost people t um, big, cost, um, led to really costly mistakes, right? That's what the whole intention of it was, right? Let's review these really contentious decisions, fouls in the box, um, you know, um, the, the elbow thing, maybe an offside, maybe goal line technology, whatever it may be. Let's, take, let's put that into the hands of technology so we can ensure that the right decision, the right result is, is achieved. So when VAR got introduced, of course, it's a bit, you know, it's a bit cumbersome. It takes a bit of a while for the referee to come to the decision, but that's okay. I'm more than happy for the referee to see something on the screen and then decide against it. Because what you've seen actually with VAR is that more often than not, it reveals the incompetencies of the referee sometimes. Referees sometimes will see something on the screen and still not give the decision, right? Sometimes because they don't want to look dumb, they, they, just don't, they just have a different interpretation of it, whatever it may be. But at least we have that um, satisfaction as fans that referees seen it on screen. Because sometimes seeing stuff in real life, and again, I have sympathy for referees. Football, especially at that level. If you go to watch a game, I think a lot of armchair critics don't really understand this, but if you actually go watch a game, the frightening thing is how fast it is. How big the players are and how quickly um, the transitions in play happen. On TV, it's always a bit slower, but it's very, very quick. And the referees having to run up and down, up and down, side, left and right, left and right. And always keep up with the play. It's a very, very hard job to do. So to get the decisions right, to make sure that um, you're not fucking up and you're, you're, you're making the right calls, it, they need a bit of help. And if the help is a screen, then so be it. So when referee went to the screen, I automatically knew it would be a, it would be a, it would be a penalty because the optics didn't look great. Kimpembe jumped jumped towards the ball with his face towards the ball looking at it 
Then he turned in the air and he put his arms out. That's not what you do. Any other any other goal defender you've seen, especially in the European leagues, whenever they're in the box defending and someone kicks the ball in, the first thing they do is put their hands behind their back, right? As an illustration to the referee, like, look, I'm not, my hands are not out in an unnatural position. I'm going to try and block it with my feet. That's the best you can do because the worst thing that you can do is give away a penalty because penalties are the most brutal decisions the team can get, especially when you listen to what Thomas Tunchal said, um, the PSG coach, that... It, it was a bit of pill to swallow because obviously he doesn't really agree with the VAR decision. But was, and but in his in his, but in his case, from the technique that um, Dalot was taking with the ball, and the fact that he, he let back so much, the ball is going to go over anyway, regardless if Kimpembe touched it. So to get punished to, with a penalty for a ball that was going to go miles over the bar, it really hurts. Which again, I really have sympathy for. Again, apologies for the washing machine, but it is what it is. I have sympathy for that, hundred percent. But again, the rules state. If you make yourself bigger than you make it, if you make your body bigger than what it is, extend yourself out, and the, and the ball hits hit, ten, hits your arm, even if it's not intentional, that's a penalty. And luckily for us, the referee um, decided to give it. And yeah, um, here we are, man. Um, the the penalty comes. There's loads of commotion. Rashford's having to wait. He puts the ball down. There's loads of pressure on him. And he smashes it, absolutely smashes it, absolutely smashes it top corner. Buffon, no chance. And and then you hear that was the first time he's ever taken the penalty for United. Incredible, incredible. And then of course there's like over ten minutes of added extra time, which you know um, is um, understandable considering the amount of injuries happened. You no, know, who, who came off? Uh, Draxler came off injured. Um, and then considering the amount of time it took to get the decision of the penalty, I'm not too fussed about that. But we held on. We brought on Chong. We brought on Mason Greenwood. They played pretty well. Chong I was a bit nervous for because he got the ball towards the end of the half and he kind of did a bit of a dribble and tried to come inside instead of just knocking it out wide. And I was afraid that the, the, when he got the free, when the resulting free kick happened that um, he was going to get punished for it. But luckily it didn't happen. And just in general, man, like... I don't know what to say. Like, I don't know what to say. I wasn't... I was... Um, I'm a big... Don't get me wrong. I'm the biggest... Um, I don't know. Like, I've always... Like, Soul Shark for me was always a bit of a stopgap in the beginning, right? Then the results started coming in. Then you started seeing the the faces on the bench, the overall ambience of the club, the things that players were saying coming out in public. Because, you know, Mourinho time there, you didn't really get any player coming out out of their own accord, really backing him and saying anything of any sort of worth or, you know, really patting him on the back. So it seemed like the players were going out of their way to let everyone know that, no, this guy has really improved the atmosphere of the club. Then it got me thinking, you know, then you see what Pochino is doing with Tottenham and with the lack of funds and the fact that he's able to get them so high up the, the Premier League. And it's really kind of testing a resolve of like, let's take the emotion out of it. Maybe Pochettino, in terms of like proven record, he's a better option. But then on nights like these, considering the fact that we came back and won the game in the dying minutes of the, of the football game, the fact that we went there and won the game with a depleted side, it's just, you have to give it to him, right? You have to give the job to Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. And I think, we all know, I think so. I think, personally, that he's definitely going to get it. And I have to just say out loud that I don't care if it goes all tits up to next season. I don't care if he ends up, you know, finishing eighth next season because, you know, it doesn't really work out. He's, he's forever going to be remembered as the manager that came in and gave us back our club. He brought back the feeling of what it means to be a Man United fan. We no longer feel down in the dumps about our team anymore. We're no longer going into games negative. We're no longer going into games hoping for the worst. We're no longer going into games trying to hold on to a 1-0 victory. We're attacking teams. We're on the front foot. And that's what man, and that's what Gunnar Solskjaer has done. And on top of that, he's introduced younger players. He's given, he's, he's allowed, he's resurrected careers. McTominay, Pereira, Fred. Three players who a lot of fans were under Mourinho's tenure would have been happy for them to leave. He's resurrected their careers, man. Like, it's absolutely insane. Insane. Um, and I'm just really happy. I'm really happy and I'm just proud of the, the guys and what they've done, how they've achieved it on, you know, in dire straits against a team that everyone was tipping to maybe win the, win the fucking whole thing. And yeah, I'm just over the moon, man. Over the fucking moon. I just want to let you guys know about it. So, I was screaming my head off. My voice is still probably hurting a little bit now this morning, but... Yeah, I'm going to step into the sunlight today feeling like a million bucks. And I just want to leave that there for now. Actually, no, I'm going to just upload this on my YouTube just as a, a Man United only thing and, and leave the podcast for tomorrow. But yeah, um, we're through, man. United won 3-1. We're fucking through. Ollie's at the wheel. Ollie's at the bloody wheel. And long, long may it continue, man. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. See you guys again really soon. Um, like and subscribe and all that. Peace. Jesus Christ.